Hello, everybody. Hey, I just wanted to make sure before we get started, glad you're on here, Richard. How is the microphone? Very good. Okay, great. We're going to stick with that one then. Um, yes, excellent. I'm just wondering where the rest of the world is at tonight. Um, we have a lot of uh, prayer that we need. Unusual prayer in kind of a way. Um, I'm glad you're here. Um, yeah, un kind of unusual prayer in a little bit of a way uh, because. We want to be praying for Miss uh, Cindy's mom and um, and Mrs. Hastings, and then also uh, we want to be praying for uh, Don Andriaco. And what's unusual about it is what we need to be praying for, for because we need to be praying that their bodies give out and they make the way to heaven. Both of them, they're both in really really bad shape, and uh, both need to um neither one of them want to be here any anymore they're both very senior and very sick in their bodies so they need to be released from those bodies and be be taken into the heavens uh we want to continue to pray for our country um maybe that's where everybody's at tonight is they're watching the democrat debate in las vegas you think no um anyway uh we want to pray for them and then we'll get started <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's it, Richard. So um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get started with our with our class tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we give you honor and praise and glory. We lift you up, Lord God, because you are sovereign over all the earth. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And Father, we just ask you in the name of the Lord Jesus to meet with the people of Messiah Community Church. Meet with them tonight, Lord God. Teach them your word. Teach them the, the truth of your word. Teach them the power of your word. And Father, we just pray, Lord God, that in everything, Christ Jesus would be seen, Father, that his grace pouring out over us would be the preeminent thing in our lives. Father, we ask for Brother Don and for Miss Hastings, Lord God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Give them the faith and give them the power, Lord God, to release their bodies to the earth that their spirits might flee into the heavens. Father, we thank you and we praise you for it. Father, we thank you that you're touching them in the name of the Lord Jesus. Help them to be free from their from their earthly uh, vessels. And we just give you praise and glory for it in Jesus name. Father, bless our our uh, study tonight. We are going to learn some things from your word. Father, we're going to see Jesus in so many things. We just thank you and praise you for it. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus, amen. Well, there we go. Now, um, if you guys would just give me one second, I need to... Um, did you put pictures? Oh, Dad, to answer you on the echo, no, we did not. Um, let me uh, let me just send something out real quick to a few of the people that normally are on here, um, because I have no idea where folks went tonight. But we need them on because it makes for an interesting class. Uh, the more we have, the merrier. So we want to we want to pray for uh, this class especially to pick up. Um, there's a lot that we're learning, and there's a lot that we can pick up from the Old Testament. We want to keep going through that and hammer on that because of the power that is there as we learn the, the truth through the Old Testament. So tonight we're going to be starting um, starting in a in the book of Genesis still, we're going to go back to Noah and we're going to catch just the, the last part of what we taught last week and then go on from there into um, a couple of other things because it's some really interesting stuff tonight where we find things that are in the New Testament that I think in the New Testament we get explained somewhat in the old. Um, and, it, and it's going to be really interesting. Um, who are we missing here? Nancy, right? Nancy McFadden. 
Anybody else we're missing? I, I know there is. Um, all right. Genesis chapter 6, verse number 18. But I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Now, God establishes a covenant uh, with Jesus, just as he did with Noah, to preserve the, the earth alive. He does that with Jesus on the cross. Both are going into wooden vessels to preserve the earth alive. Noah's covenant was available to all who entered the ark. Of course, nobody did. Nobody wanted to. Um, even though Noah preached it, he, the word says he was a preacher of righteousness. Think of the parallels between him and Jesus. Jesus came preaching righteousness. And who showed up at the cross? John, right? And his mother. And that was a little bit later on, actually. Uh, they, they weren't even. Um, actually, they, they, they were there. John came a little late to the party. Mary, we're not sure exactly when she got there, along with the other Mary and Mary Magdalene. Other than that, none of the disciples were to be found. People weren't clamoring. They didn't want to get on the cross with him. People weren't trying to get in the same place Jesus was at. The same thing happened with Noah. Um, the covenant that God makes with Jesus is to all who trust in him. Yeah, you're right, Richard. The cross is not the finished work of Jesus Christ. And and as well, the um, actually the um, the ark was not the finished work of Noah. And think about that. The finished work of Noah is when they came out of the ark and they they were on dry ground and they began again a new nation. With Noah and his sons and his sons' wives. Yeah, to replenish the earth. What did Jesus tell us? Go and replenish the earth, right? Only with believers. The way we replenish it is we get born again believers. The way Noah and his sons were going to replenish the earth was born again people or born the first time people. So the ark was um, was the finished work of Noah and the cross, the finished work of Christ. As far as the redemption part for for the sacrifice for our sins. Both of those were the sacrifice for our sin. Uh, in Noah's case, it was his family leaving everything, getting into the ark with all the animals um, and nobody else coming with him. For Jesus, it was going to the cross and um, nobody goes with him. It, it's him alone. Um, Jesus' death was the finished work of, re of what he was going to do to sacrifice. It was not his finished work as far as mankind was concerned. Because his finished work doesn't happen until after the cross and he resurrects and is then seated at the right hand of his father and glorified. Um, when that happens, when Jesus finally gets there to that place in time, that's when the finished work of Jesus is. With, with Noah, it's the same way. The finished work of Noah is not until he lands on dry ground. And he releases all those animals back out into the earth, and he and his family go out and begin to replenish the earth. That's when the finished work of Noah happens. The finished work of Jesus is actually continuing to this day, is the finished work of Jesus. And it will continue, because as people get saved, it will continue until uh, everything finally comes to an end, as in the book of Revelation. Because when um, if Jesus had finished, or if everything was finished, then what happened at Pentecost when Jesus told the disciples that they were to take this word and power and authority into all the streets? Um, you know, that is a good question. Noah lived, um, I mean, I'll tell you, I, I think 900 years. I believe. Um, if anybody knows the answer to that, um, yeah, I, I think I think Noah was. Um, let's see. Well, I'll tell you tell you in just a second. Uh, the covenant. And Noah lived uh, after the flood. 
All the years of Noah were 950 years, and Noah died. 950 years. So, <clears throat> 980 is a good guess. That I think that was Methuselah. Yeah, a very long time. Exactly right. Um, yeah, Richard, and you are right. God says to Jesus, sit at my right hand until, I, until your enemies are made a footstool under your feet. Now, now think about this. He says the last enemy is death. So even though all enemies have been put under Jesus, the last enemy, death, has not been put under Jesus and will not be put under Jesus until after, until after the final judgment comes. And, and then the last enemy, death, will be put under. So, yeah, Ed, that's that's happening every year. We're here, and, and every tongue will confess. Um, and everybody's had a chance for salvation. Exactly, Richard. That's why his finished work is still a work in progress. It, it it's still continuing on. Otherwise, he wouldn't have told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He wouldn't have he wouldn't have told them to go lay hands on the sick. Uh, cast out devils, raise the dead. He wouldn't have told them all that if what he was, what he, uh, if his work was finished, because his work wasn't finished. His work carried on into his sons and daughters, which are us. Just like Noah's finished work finished on or carried on as his children went out and began to procreate and replenish the earth. Yeah, we are his workers now, and that's the reason why he said we'll do greater works in. Greater works than these that he did will we do also, which you think of the of the parallels. It, it is incredible, and it's incredible how much the church does not do and does not know in this day and age. We um, and, and I don't know why that, you know, maybe it's complacency. Maybe it's, you know, a few things didn't work. Somebody laid hands on somebody back at, a you know, uh it one of the the, the uh, open air markets in Jerusalem, and the person didn't get healed, or they did. They tried to raise somebody from the dead. It didn't happen, so they well, you know, maybe that doesn't work because that's what we do essentially today in, in denominations and everything else, in all the cross churches, is we just avoid those things that we think may not work, so we just don't do them. And and I I mean I understand. Let's stick with the with the truth of salvation. Let's just stick with salvation. But but think about the opportunities for people to be saved around miracles, around supernatural events. I mean I I believe that those are real things. I believe that they are possible. Um, do I think we need to go create them? Because there are a lot of people creating miracles, you know, and and. Uh, like when you pray for somebody in a, in a prayer line or something, you about rip their head off so that they fall over. Uh, let's let's not go there. L let's just let the Lord work. Let the Lord do what he's going to do. Um, Ed says, can you imagine if a great number of the people Noah had preached to about God would have repented and helped him with the ark? What, uh, yeah, it would have been a, it would have been amazing. It, think about think about today. How many people we preach to? That never change their mind. They never, they they never change their heart. They never change their mind ab about who God is, about the work of Christ. They never do. Um, Richard says because we think it is our it is a failure on our part if nothing happens. Yeah, you're you're exactly right, Richard. We we think somehow we failed or God failed us. And and Noah could have felt that. I mean, the guy's out there preaching. It it says he preached for a hundred years. Um, I mean, I hope to be preaching for a long time, but a hundred years is a little far fetched, you know. Um, far, uh, he preached righteousness for a hundred years, and nobody got into the ark except for he and his his sons and his his sons' wives. That's all that got in the ark, and he preached righteousness for a hundred years, and people laughed at him. They scoffed said it wasn't going to happen. So when we think about all that, we, we can draw, we can see the parallel, the type and shadow of Jesus in it all. Now, we're going to get some other interesting things here. Uh, one of the other comparisons of Noah is that he did all that the Lord commanded him to do. Genesis 7, 5 says, Noah did all that the Lord commanded him to do. All. Jesus said he only did what, what he saw his father do and only said what he heard his father say. John 8, 28 and 8, 38. 
It's interesting that Jesus went into the wilderness for 40 days, just as the floodwaters fell for 40 days. He also spent 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection. The rain of the Spirit fell on those disciples for that 40-day uh, period, just as the rain fell on the earth for 40-day period. Because during that 40 days, they learned everything that they could possibly learn about the Lord without without having the the uh, complete infilling in that Pentecost experience. Um, and, and then they were able after that to go forward and turn the world upside down. The real deluge, the breaking open of, of the deep for the disciples happened on the day of Pentecost. And, and it the same way, the rains fell for 40 days and 40 nights upon the earth. And, the, and the, it says the waters of the deep broke open and erupted over the earth. And, and there's a lot of scientists who uh, will show you on models net that they have that, that it was entirely possible that the waters underneath the earth exploded and, and flooded the earth just as the waters that were above the earth fell down upon the earth. Um, Richard says, think if Jesus failed to pray for someone because he doubted that it would work, Lazarus come out if you want to. Yeah, can you imagine that? He he never prayed that way. He he never prayed any prayers that were prayers of doubt about what would happen. We do that. I mean, we do that a lot. Um, but for God, there is a plan. Um, and and it it clearly says that when he entered certain places. Not everybody got healed. Because, it, you know, we often say, oh, everybody got healed with Jesus. No, well, there, no, there were places. It says he could not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. They weren't willing to receive. And we have to look at that today. Noah couldn't have done anything more than he did because of their unbelief, the people around him's unbelief. Now, as, as we begin to look at uh, Noah a little bit more. It says Noah and his sons sacrificed the Lord after they left the ark. So after they left the ark, they, they sacrificed the Lord. They made an offering of the clean animals and birds. We we're also asked to make an offering to the Lord of our lives. Let us offer up a sacrifice of praise, right? The fruit of our lips. After we come out of the ark of our salvation, what, what's our what's our life supposed to be like? What's what sort of thing are we asked to do? Um, yeah, Ed, you're exactly right. Unbelief stops a lot of things that could be done for, for God and that God could do for you. It's exactly right. Now, this offering that we have um, is to have the Lord smell a sweet smelling savor, just like he did with, with Noah. It says that Noah and his sons came out. They offered some animals. They, they sacrificed unto the Lord. And it was a sweet smelling savor unto his nostrils. What did he say to him? He said, you know, I'm not going to do this again. I'm not going to destroy the water again or the earth again with water. So he says, look, I'm going to give you a promise. I'll make a covenant with you. He said, look up in the sky. And, and then he uh, put a bow in the sky rainbow. And he said, whenever it rains, you see the clouds coming over and, and the sun begins to come out again. You're going to look up, you're going to see that bow and you're going to know that I remember you. And he, he said, it's going to keep seed time and harvest is going to continue. And that's exactly what the Lord told us after Jesus. He said, after this seed time and harvest, they're going to continue. In Genesis 9, 4, there's an interesting verse here um, that I want to get to because this this is not mentioned until this time. This is the first mention of this, and, and it becomes excessively important. But you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is, its blood. God tells Noah for the first time in his sons, they're, they're permitted to eat animals. They're permitted to eat flesh. 
And they're permitted to eat only, though, look what it says, not flesh with its blood in it. They're not, they're not allowed to eat blood. They're, they're allowed to partake of animals for food. Um, it's, it's, um, it's the first time um, this thing is mentioned. Oh, you talking about you talking about the rainbow? Yeah, Ed, you're you're exactly right. There are, there are groups here that have grabbed the rainbow and and tried to make it mean something else, but but it simply meant, means I, I know what they what they say and I know why they say it um, because they're they're trying to throw that in the face of Christians. But the real truth of it is that that bow was set in the sky, and and if they want to know the truth about it. The earth was destroyed, destroyed because of homosexuality and lesbianism. It was totally destroyed because of that and and because of the uh, the, the relationship that m women were having with with angels. And, and so that that became a disaster. So um, we, we want to. I mean, keep that in the back of your head, because that, that's something I think as time goes on, um, we're, we're going to see some things. It's, it, I think the end days are upon us, and we are going to experience a great revival, but we are also going to experience a great persecution and, and a great counter revival of, of uh, evil. Jesus brings this to the ultimate conclusion through the sacrifice of his own son. When I mean, of course, he, he's telling us here about the blood sacrifice. And um, he says, do not. That's a good point. Uh, Joyce says the LBGTQ flat has six colors. Rainbows have seven. Always keep that in mind. There is always a counterfeit. And six is the number of man. And seven is the number of God. Um, and, and keep that in mind because they, they messed up. <laughs> now, the blood sacrifice goes out, right? The blood sacrifice goes out. God's, it, it's the same one that Cain and Abel, uh, Cain knew, I mean, Abel knew that God required a blood sacrifice. He gives him one. Noah's sons know this. But God says for the first time how important this blood is. Do not eat the blood because life is in the blood. Life is in the blood of Christ. And God makes that crystal clear when he sacrifices his own son for the redemption of mankind. Indeed, for the for the entire earth, God opens the door for men to begin to eat animals as they had not previously done. And but think about this. He gives animals something that he had not given them before. He gives them a fear of man. For their own protection. And, and we're told that animals then, I mean, because think about that, all the animals, I mean, they just pranced into the ark. It did lions, tigers, and bears. Oh my. They all came into the ark, right? And and they weren't, there wasn't a fight about that. They, they weren't ground, they weren't trying to swipe it, no one, you know, chew his arm off or anything. They came in willfully. After the ark, though, it changed. And, and now we know animals, uh, wild animals, they're afraid. All wild animals are afraid of men. Um, it, it's, I mean, from squirrels to whatever. David Goodsick's study of the Bible gives us a couple things that, that I want to point out because this blood sacrifice comes in and we want to we follow this down. Um, and, and if anybody would want a copy of this, I, I can probably email it to you. Uh, take a look at this. The importance of the idea of blood in the Bible is shown by, by how often the word is used. It is used 424 times in 357 separate verses in the New King James Version. In, in Exodus 12, 13, blood was the sign of mercy for Israel at the first Passover. Put the blood on the doorpost, right? Blood sealed God's covenant with Israel in Exodus 24, 8. They, they did sacrifice. It sealed the covenant. Blood sanctified the altar. In Exodus 29, 12, he tells us that they took blood. They, they uh, sprinkled it upon the altar and, and it sanctified it. Blood set aside the priest. 
they would dip their thumb into the uh, Aaron would dip his thumb into the blood of a sacrificed animal and he would put it on the foreheads and on the hands of the priest and on their feet. Ooh, another reference to Jesus. Um, and, and we'll get to the high priest way later on, but um, man, you talk about, I don't, we may spend weeks talking about the high priest and Jesus. Uh, blood made atonement for God's people. So in Exodus 30, 10, we find out that it is by blood that an atonement for sin is made. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Blood sealed the new covenant. In Matthew 26, 28, it says that blood sealed the new covenant. Blood justifies us. Romans 5 and 9 tells us that the blood of Christ justified us, made us just before God. We had no right to be before God. The blood justified our life. Whatever happened in our life previously, that blood made us just. Even though we weren't just, it made us just. Blood brings redemption in, in Ephesians 1 and 7. It says that blood is for our redemption. So it, it actually bought us back. Blood brings peace with God. In Colossians 1.20, it says that um, we have peace with God through the blood of Christ. Blood cleanses us. Hebrews 9.14 and John, uh, 1 John 1, 7 both tells us that his blood cleanses us from all sin. Blood gives entrance to God's holy place. In Hebrews 10 and 19, it says that the entrance into the most holy place was bought with the blood of, of the sacrifice Christ. Blood sanctifies us. Not the altar. Not just the altar. Blood sanctifies us. Hebrews 13, 12. Blood enables us to overcome Satan. Because of all the things above, all the things that are, that are above that, I just rattled off there. The blood of Christ overcomes we we are uh, we overcome him means the enemy by the blood of the lamb by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony the blood of the lamb comes before the word of our testimony the blood of the lamb is is the thing that redeems us completely god tells noah that blood is going to be required from that hand that sheds blood he tells him that. He says, "From listen, from whoever sheds blood of a man, blood will be required. It's intended to give us pause to those that who would take life so callously. So somebody, somebody that, I mean, think about it today with the abortion issue. Think about uh, the euthanasia issue. Think about a lot of things. Listen, I thought about it when it comes to the death penalty. By shedding somebody's blood, blood will be required. Now, it doesn't say a guilty man's, you know, it's going to be required for a guilty man. It's going to be required for an innocent man. Uh, it, it doesn't separate. It just says for, for any man that is their blood is shed, blood will be required. And that is absolutely true. Whether it's in warfare or it's in, in some violent crime or something else, blood's required. Many native tribes, uh, upon killing a meal, you know, they, they shoot a deer or they shoot a, a rabbit or something in the woods or a squirrel. Uh, they would come and they would, and, and I think some of the, a lot of the African tribes would do this as well. They would go to the, uh, the animal they just killed and they would thank it. They would, they would actually thank it for giving up their life for them so that they could eat. And there, there's, there's a great bit of, um, that I, I think I think we miss a great bit of gratitude for the shed blood because we we don't practice anything like that today. We don't we don't see that. I I know guys who are hunters, and and they do make reference to it. Um. No, Richard, we don't have to shed our blood to get to get to God. Shedding of blood has already happened in Christ, but we do have to accept His blood. We do have to accept that that shed blood for us, and and I, that's that's a thing that the uh, I think so many um, 
religious orders or cultures today are getting away from. There are places that say, oh, we never talk about the blood. Well, we ought to talk about the blood. We ought, absolutely ought to talk about the blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Richard says the old life was in the blood, our physical bodies. Now we have the new life. It is the light in the face of Jesus Christ. He no longer has blood in his body, though he has a body. He is light, and there is no darkness in him, only life and light. That's exactly right. And, and we have, um, his blood was completely shed for us once. We don't have to keep shedding his blood for, him, for us. It, it's a mistake I think a, a lot of people have made that, you know, and that's when we used to go out places and, and preach at different uh, venues and that. And sometimes in prison, I ask anybody here been saved? People raise their hand and say, um, how many have been saved more than once? There would always be a good group of people that would raise their hand. Yeah. And I'd say, well, then you haven't been at all. Because you only need it once. And only once is it real. Only once is it the thing that's going to buy your um, buy your salvation. And it happened once in Christ. And you only need to do it once if it's real. If you really put your faith and your trust there. And you just know that you know that you know that it's done. And, and that's why we can't mess around and, and uh, have the, the, our talk and our teaching and our, our faith in the blood reduced in any way. But rather, we need to lift it up and we need to, we need to talk about it. Look at all the things that it did for us. And, and that's something we, we need to really learn, something that Noah started. Now, look at Genesis 19, uh, 9, 14 through 15. It shall be when, when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud. And I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. Now, God, God works in patterns. Um, Solomon said, there is nothing new under the sun. Everything that is, has already been. God has a pattern in which he brings judgment. Then either confirms or makes a new covenant. He either confirms a covenant or he makes a covenant that promises not to bring judgment on mankind in the same manner again. He repeats this pattern all through the Old Testament. God brings a judgment for something. It usually Israel's silliness, right? Or their stupidity, one of the two. And he brings a judgment on them. Then he says, okay, here's how, here's how you get out of this. And, and he gives them a way out. And he says, I'm not going to do it that way again. And it's like he said, you know, I, I didn't like that. I, I, didn't like, I didn't like destroying you like that. I didn't like how that was. And he doesn't repeat the same thing again. And then he'll make a covenant. Look, here's one more time. I, I can, I got a covenant with you. Let's confirm that covenant again. We talk about grace and mercy. I mean, we've got it in Christ. Then he gets to Jesus. Um, all the things he shows us in the Old Testament are a great picture of what we get in Christ. And indeed, the New Testament says all those things that happened to them, talking about the Old Testament people, all those things that happened to them, happened to them as examples for us so that we would know where we ought to go and how we ought to go about it so that we would have that in our life. Uh, it's, it's a, the Old Testament is a great picture of the grace of Christ because what the Old Testament gives us is a picture of people failing, falling, being picked back up, having grace reinstituted to them, them going on again, falling again, getting back up. Proverbs says a righteous man falls seven times, yet rises again. That makes you wonder what an unrighteous man does. Does he fall and never get up? That, that's what I think, because the reason why we rise again is because of the grace of Christ. Ed says Satan would have been very happy to see God destroy all of mankind in the flood because he was jealous. Yeah, you're exactly right, Ed. 
and and he was defeated, uh, and death and hell was defeated by Jesus when when Jesus went down there, and Satan would want to drag us all in the same course. That's the reason why failure. If I can just say this like this, failure is not an option for the believer. It's just not. I mean, we we may not make it in something. We we may have a setback in some way, but it's not an option to us to fail and stay down. It's not an option to stay down. Okay, if we exactly, Richard, we really can't fail in, unless we stop. And so many times in the scriptures, it tells us over and over again, he who endures till the end, he who makes it till the end, all, all those things. It, it, it keeps telling us that over and over. It, the whole idea of Christ is in, in the same idea as we, we see in Noah. The end is not the end. And it never is for the believer. The, it's like the end is the beginning all the time, you know? The disciples, what did they think when Jesus went to the cross? Probably the same thing that uh, many people thought when when uh, Noah went into the into the ark. You know, it oh, it's the end, and it wasn't the end, and that's the way it is for us believers. Genesis eleven three through nine. Then they said to one another, "Now we're going to." kind of blow past some of the genealogy of Noah and his sons and all that uh, and, and get to um, get to the Tower of Babel because it's not too long after they get out of the ark. They, they begin to multiply. His sons live a long time. It says they have sons and daughters, which means many. They, I mean, they, they have kids. That, I mean, just bunches of them. And they're replenishing the earth. Now, they're the only people, six, six people alive, right? Um, yes. For people who are wondering, yes, cousins had to marry cousins and all that kind of stuff. And and but they're procreating and there is no. Um, there There is no um, genetic flaws at this point in time. The you know, a, a brother and a sister or a brother and a, I mean, a, a guy and his cousin could marry, have children and you wouldn't have had the genetic breakdown. As, as it is today. Yeah, there's not a genetic flaw in them, Ed. Not not at this point in time. That that happens over time, and and will continue to happen. Um, and and we get to this place where there's there's lots of people on the earth, but they're not all spread out. And what did God tell them to do? God told them to multiply and replenish the earth. He he wasn't talking about replenish. Uh, the place where they were was right in the Middle East. Uh, Iraq, Iran, uh, Syria, that whole region right there. Um, yeah, Richard, we will get fixed bodies, glorified genes, glorified everything. And um, so they all stayed right in that, that, that region that we now call the Middle East. And at Babel, which is where modern day Babylon or, well, Babylon became, which is modern day um, the green zone right now over in Iraq. Um, Baghdad, that, that's Babylon. That's right where Babylon was. And that's right where Babel was built. Now, it says, they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. God told them to what? Scatter abroad. What, what did they say? We don't want to be scattered abroad. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. Now, this was no doubt an extremely excessively tall tower. Now, I, I've read a, a pretty good deal of commentary on the whole Tower of Babel thing, and it was way tall compared to anything that was built then, uh, maybe as tall as anything we've seen built uh, in, this, in this era. Um, yet they didn't get to finish it. But they, they came close, but they didn't get to finish it. It would have been built, now think about this, with brick and mortar. 
uh, the the asphalt for mortar that they used would have been the same stuff Noah used on the outside of the ark to hold the, the boards of the ark together, and, along with pegs. Now, they're building this out of brick, and they're using this mortar. Now, the one thing about this asphalt for mortar is it is waterproof. Now, why do you suppose that they would build such a high tower that is waterproof? Hmm. Maybe they're thinking of another flood, right? So they're already in doubt of what God said about the bow in the sky and, and that it's not possible for them to be flooded out again. So they're building a tower that is essentially a waterproof tower that reaches to the heavens. It's going to be taller than all the mountains around. Now, it wasn't necessarily that they were trying to reach up into the heavens. Not necessarily, because if that were the truth, why didn't they pick it? A, a high ridge to build their thing on. Instead, what they did, is they built it in the plain. And, and it would have been out very pretty far. The base of it would have had been huge in order for them to go up because they were stacking it up kind of like a, uh, a pyramid type of thing to get it as tall as they could make it. And, and they're wanting to elevate themselves into the highest seat they can above the flow, flow waters, above everything that they know. Now, this is one of the most inter interesting accounts of the, in the history of man that I think that we can get about man's um, man's unbelief, foolishness, and his uh, antagonistic ways toward God. Man continually looks to ele elevate himself to the level of God. He just he wants to get there. The Lord here makes a physical appearance when he says. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. We know it was the Lord that came down. And we'll take a look at this with Abram, too. We know it was Jesus that came down because no man can look at, the, at God and live. They can't see the face of God and live. And, and uh, besides that, God occupies the universe. He occupies all of it. Jesus is the only person that could have come down from the Godhead. He's not a spirit being, although he's, he is a spirit being. He's God, but he's man. He wasn't incarnate man in, the, in a flesh and blood being at this point in time, but he was man in, in look, physical attributes. He comes down to see the tower. And they, uh, you know, the Lord says, and let's see if I, if I put this in here. And the Lord said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them because they could communicate in one language. Nothing that they proposed to do, nothing that they communi communicated between each other would be off limits to them. They could do just about anything that they wanted to, right? And they say, come, let us go down. This is God speaking. Let us go down. And there confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel. Babel, right? Because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. The Lord told Noah and his sons, go forth, multiply, replenish the earth, go, go out, spread out all over the earth. Take, take life all over the earth. And they didn't. They did not. Yeah, and they did start arguing with one another and they couldn't understand each other. And God scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Now, what do you think the language that they spoke was before and after? Arabic or Hebrew, Dad? All right. Anybody else? I'm going to throw your two cents in. 
before I before I change pages. So the Lord scattered them all over the face of the earth, and it confused their language, that they may not understand one another's. Get this, they couldn't understand one another. The language there is pretty clear. If I'm talking to somebody and my brother's standing right next to me, and and after the Lord comes down and he begins to scatter us abroad and chase it, I don't know how he did it to scatter people abroad, but I talk to my brother and he looks at me and he can't understand anything I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good, Ed. Ed says, try to ask someone in another country where the toilet is. Better start before you really have to go. That's exactly right. Um, could it have been that the language they spoke before the tower was the language of the angels? They understood God, and I mean Jesus, when he came down. They understood him. When Jesus made an appearance before them, they understood who he was. There they understood his language. And the angels before that time, when the angels came down and spoke with the daughters of men, they understood the angels. They all understood. And there wasn't anybody that didn't understand. They all spoke the same. Jesus in his pre-incarnate appearances to him. Of course, you could say, well, he was God. He could speak any language he wanted to speak. Okay. Well, the angels came down, they could speak any language they, but all the people spoke the same language too. God talked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day, walked with them, talked with them. They understood, they understood him. It doesn't say that they spoke a different language than him. And afterward, God confounded their languages so that they all spoke a different language than their original language. So everyone spoke. Nobody, because think about this. If somebody had been speaking in their original language that they all understood, when they spoke in that language, they could have been the catalyst that helped everybody because everybody could have understood what they were saying. But no one spoke in any of their original language, the, the entire earth. There was no original language left. We got that? None. Now, at the day of Pentecost, the Holy Ghost comes and brings a language to mankind that is the language of the heavens. All tongue talkers speak the same language in prayer. Whereas they couldn't understand the new, right? They couldn't understand the new language. Get Think about this now. I have been to other countries with believers who were speaking in tongues. They were speaking their native languages. In, in uh, the one instance, there were several native languages being spoken around me that were tribal languages, different tribes. Uh, and they were, they were speaking the same. They were, they were speaking their tribal language so that the people right there understood what they were saying within that tribe. I understood and, and got to hear their language being spoken. And it, it was very distinctly different languages. But when we began to worship and people began to praise and people began then to speak in tongues and, and call out to the Lord in, in tongues, everybody sounded the same. Everybody was speaking the same language. It was amazing. Now, maybe that was just how my ears were hearing, but I don't think so. Because it sounded like the same thing that happens to me when, when I pray in the Spirit. Now, just, just a hypothesis. What language is it that we cannot understand? What's the only language we don't have interpreters for other than supernatural interpreters? Tongues. Paul says that though I speak in the language of men and angels, 1 Corinthians 13, 1, though I speak in the language of men and angels, he obviously understood tongues to be an ang a language of angels, but I do not. Uh, but I did not have love, or do not have love. Paul did. Paul understand that the language he spoke in the spirit was that of the angels. He did have the opportunity to go to heaven and report back to the earth. Is it possible he remembered or even understood that great language of the heavens? How is it the tongues around the globe sounds the same? 
and our bodies know instinctively to speak it when we receive this immersion in the Holy Ghost. How is it that we we know instinctively? Nobody, listen to me, I, I had heard tongues maybe once at, at um, Betty's Uncle Louie's church in Florida where he went. Uh, they were tongue talkers. Uh, and I, I maybe heard it once there. Never heard it any other times. When I got filled with the Spirit, I instinctively knew knew to speak this language. And the funny thing is that when I when I've been with other people and led them into believing for the baptism in the Spirit, and they begin to speak, it sounds just like what I spoke. And and how do you how do we know instinctively? To speak that, unless it comes out of the spirit inside of us, and we all have the same joint spirit. Our prayer language changes dramatically from our native language to a new and un unknown language that nobody on earth knows. It's pretty amazing. There isn't any interpreter standing there saying, oh, yeah, uh, I've studied this in school, and they're saying blah, 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 blah. Think about that. Just a hypothesis for you. But listen to this. Language being a major hurdle that we need to overcome for nations to com communicate with each other. Could it be that God gave a universal language to us who believe so we could do the work of reaching the nations? On the day of Pentecost, all the different representatives of all the different nations present in Jerusalem that they heard the disciples speak in their native tongues. Could it be that the language of the Spirit reached the ears of these people and it translated supernaturally in them to their language? Because it never says that the disciples came out and spoke their tongue. It doesn't say that they came out and spoke Parthian and Mede and, and Persian and all that. Uh-oh, can everybody else hear me? Uh, give me a thumbs up or give me a uh, something if you can hear. Um, okay. Let me send a message to Richard. No. Anyway, um, this, this is just something to go, hmm, about. Is it possible that the language the angels speak is the basis of all language, for all language? It, is, it, is it possible? Is it possible that um, that language that we were given in the spirit is the basis for us to communicate with all believers. Perfect communication, language we don't understand. Um, and, and language that everybody can get. Yet that might be might be a little different than math, but it's a uh, think about that. Think about that, because when we when we pray in the spirit, it, it says, yeah, we, we ought to have understanding. We ought to have an understanding uh, or, or shut up. If people around us can't can't understand what we're saying, shut up. But I do believe that when we pray in the spirit, uh, people do understand. And it, it's just interesting, the reaction that we get. Now, in Genesis 11, we go from the account of the Tower of Babel through the genealogy of Noah's sons, especially Shem, to a man named Terah. Terah is Abram's father. Abram's name literally means literally high father. Sarah is a half sister of Abram, and her name means uh, dominative from a root meaning the head person. Now, by this, think about this. We get Abram, who is supposed to be a high father, but he has no children. Um, and we have Sarai who's completely barren, 
And she's a, she's a dominant personality, a dominant person. Hey, thanks, Barb. She, she's a dominant person. And so here we have these, these two, and they have no children. And the thing that they want more than anything in the world is children. But they're idol worshipers and idol makers. That's what Abraham's family business is, was Tara, his, his father. That's what he did. He made idols. Uh, and it, it was a fairly prosperous trading town. Uh, Ur of the Chaldees, it, it was a, it, I mean, it was a crossroads of traders. And they sold off their idols. Abraham loses his father. He doesn't have any children. Despite the idols he worships, he doesn't have any. He seeks to find the one who created everything. God responds to him. And the story of faith begins. And that's where we're going to end right there. Next week, we are going to dive into uh, Abram and how he becomes Abram and becomes Abraham from Abram. We're going to dive in and we're going to find out how Sarai becomes Sarah and, and all by the grace of Almighty God. It's a great account. I hope you guys learned something. Got a few things to scratch your heads about and, and picked up a few things tonight. The Bible is fascinating, how it relates to us today, how it can change our life today from what happened in the Old Testament was exactly what God had intended for us to to have go on. And uh, Mike, hola. Um, so I, I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. Bless you. Have a great week in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we will see you all on Sunday.